meant a lot to me to be able to do that as well. With that being said, let's let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Two weeks ago, I, of course I wasn't here last week, two weeks ago when we were here, we did verses 1 and 2. I just want to touch on them again for a second, and then we'll get into the other verses. Today's message is a very important one. As I've been looking at this and going over the scripture, and I'm praying with, with, with all my heart that, that God would, would truly speak this through me the way he has given it to me. Sometimes I get in the way, and I don't want to do that today. This is an important message. And we're going to get the whole four verses in, even if we have to go a little over. I hope we don't, but, but this is important enough that if we have to, we will. Um, so now... As Scott was leading a second ago, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. <coughs> 2 Timothy 2, beginning in the first verse. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in the suffering as a good soldier. Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. As an athlete, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Father, as we come to your word, as we dig into your word today. Lord, it is my prayer that you would speak through me, your servant. Father, I know my sin. I know I am a sinner, and I know that it is your grace that has saved me, and that grace is worthy of making me able to stand and to bring your word. I thank you for that grace. I thank you for your forgiveness of my sins, and I thank you that you continually restore my relationship and my fellowship with you. Oh, Father, I pray now that as I bring these words that you have given me, yes, that it is you that speaks, but your Holy Spirit would, would bring the words to the heart of each and every person who is here, that they would be moved and you would be glorified. Let it not be honor for us, but honor and glory to you. In Christ Jesus I pray, amen. Well, as we looked at this first two verses a couple weeks ago, we, we saw that, that it is a call or, or a command that we be sharing and be a witness and be giving these things that are entrusted to us to those who will be faithful and take them forward. Those who will teach these things to other people, those who will share them, those who will believe them, those who will stand with them, those who will want to make much of Christ because of the grace that they have been strengthened by and what they have been entrusted with. So as we, we take that into consideration, we come to this third verse. Paul has already been telling us about his sufferings. Not only here in 2 Timothy, but, but throughout the scriptures that Paul wrote, we see his suffering and those things that he has faced. And in verse 3 he says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Share in the suffering. We are called, not only here, but throughout Scripture, to share in the suffering, aren't we? Now that is contrary to today's world's view of Christianity. Today they want to tell you, if you're a Christian, everything's going to be just fine and dandy. And if it's not, you just don't believe enough. Just believe a little more, and it'll get fine and dandy. You'll be healed, you'll be rich, you'll be all these things. If you just believe a little bit more. Just trust a little bit more. But that's not what the Scripture teaches. Nowhere does it say that. The Scripture teaches us that we have to pick up our cross daily and follow after <coughs> Him. Daily we pick up our cross and follow after you. 
In our, in our text here, Paul is not inviting us to join him in suffering. He is commanding us to join him in suffering. Yes, he's speaking to Timothy, but he's also speaking to every blood-bought Christian. To every single one of us who has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is calling us into this suffering. And how? He says, as a good soldier. Let's take a moment. What, what does he mean as a, as a good soldier? In fact, he goes on in verse 4 and says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Since it is aimed to please the one who enlisted him. As, as we look at as we look at that, what we're what we're seeing here, just before I get to describing this, is the command that we receive from Christ. What we're seeing is to seek first what? His kingdom and his righteousness. And then all the other things will be added on. But we are to seek first, that's Matthew 6.33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. That is truly the command that we're receiving. What happens is we get so busy with things that aren't first. And those things that aren't first cause us to fall away from what is first. And the seeking out of his kingdom and his righteousness. So as we as we look at this, I want us to, to see that, that to be a fruitful Christian, we must be willing to embrace the hardship of a good soldier. An entangled commitment. Here's a illustration that I, I found. In the early 20th century, an ad in the London newspaper read this way. It says, men wanted for hazardous journey. Small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, and constant danger. Safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. It was signed by a famous Arctic explorer named Sir Ernest Shackleton. And you know that thousands of People, thousands of men signed up for this. Thousands of men came out of the woodwork for this. And, and with that, Warren Wiersbe, I wanted to use Warren Wiersbe today because that's Gail's favorite, so I thought I'd use that today. He, uh, he says, if Jesus Christ had advertised for workers, the announcement might read something like this. Men and women wanted for difficult task of helping to build my church. You will often be misunderstood, even by those working with you. You will face constant attack from an invisible enemy. You may not see the results of your labor, and your full reward will not come till after your work is completed. It may cost you your home, your ambitions, and even your life. That is what it means to be a soldier for Christ. That's what it means. Paul wasn't a, a flowery recruiter. He wasn't like the recruiter that, that told the, the new recruit going into the Coast Guard that, that he'd be able to fish the oceans of the world. He's telling you exactly what it is. And it is not safe to be a Christian. We have had this time in America where it seems safe, but it is not safe to be a Christian. Paul knew that if you decided to follow after Christ, under any false pretenses, it wouldn't be long before you left. Have we seen people do that? Have we seen people who, who came in with their own ideas of what it meant to follow Christ, or they came in with somebody else's ideas that weren't Christ? And all of a sudden, they just go away. We have to come in ready to serve. And there's four things that I want us to look at about being a soldier. The first is a good soldier of Christ, Jesus, recognizes that you have 
been enlisted into Christ's army to fight an evil and darkness that you cannot see, but that is all around you. The imagery of a soldier shows us Christ is not inviting us to Sunday school picnic. Okay? He's not inviting us to something simple and easy. This is a battle zone. Being a Christian and being a soldier for Christ is a battle zone. And we have to be ready to fight. We have to be ready to, to be wounded and even to be killed. I've been reading a little in the Fox's Book of, of Martyrs. Has anyone ever read in this book at all? It's pretty amazing. Most of the ones in, in this one here are people from the 1500s. But what they faced and how they were killed for God's glory, it, it, it's amazing what soldiers these men were and women. I, I, was reading, I was reading one about uh, a man and a woman that were being burnt at the stake, and it was a pastor and, and someone in his congregation. They were being burnt at the stake, and, and as the fire came up, the, the woman began to, to scream, and, and the pastor told her, he said, he said, just think upon, tonight we will feast with the Lord. And she calmed allow the fire to consume her. How many of us are willing to be a soldier for Christ? You know, today's army is a little different than the army that I grew up around. We, most of us are old enough to have seen Golden Pile TV show, right? Old Sergeant Carter. You know, we, we laugh at that, but there's a lot of truth in in that style of working with the soldiers. They had to train them to prepare them for the hardest things they were ever going to face. And they really had to do that in a very short period of time, especially during wartime. They, they were preparing them to go into a battle that they may not return from. And they needed to be ready not only to protect their country, to protect themselves, but to protect their fellow soldiers around them. They had to be able to trust. They had to be able to follow commands immediately. And this was all part of the, the training to be a soldier. When we're enlisted in the army of God, we are fighting a real war. This, this is a real war. And to go into war, we need what Ephesians 6 tells us, the full armor of God. Because we are being trained, being trained, I'm telling you, to make it through to the honor and glory of God. You know, when, when somebody goes into boot camp in the military to be a soldier for, for Christ, they, they, <coughs> might, they might have to do runs. They may have to, to run day and night. Push up maybe until, until their arms feel like jello. They, they have to, to do all these things to build the man that needs to be to be able to fight the fight and to hold up against this war. And sometimes we, we, we think as, as Christians, well those things aren't going to happen to us as Christians. You know, we're not going into that kind of thing. Yes, we are. You know, let me tell you about one man who fought in this spiritual battle. His name was Job. You ever hear of him? It's not Job, it's Job. And Job was a man who, who was honoring God with his life. And then in an instant, his children and their wives were killed. His, his livelihood was taken from him. And then he was inflicted with the great sickness, with these boils. Did he curse God? His wife told him just to curse God and die. 
he chose not to because he was he was in God's army. Let me tell you, sometimes, let me rephrase that, most of the time, the things that we face, the consequences that we face in life, whether it's physical, his health, whether it's consequences for something, are, are because of things that we have done. However, we're there because that's where God has brought us to. And that's where we are to witness. And that is where we are to reveal Him, His greatness. John Piper put it this way. He put it out that, that believers use prayer as an intercom to have their mate bring more refreshments to the living room. When in fact, prayer is our walkie-talkie to call in support to the front lines of the battle. How do you use prayer? Are you, are you bringing in the, the heavenly support for God's people, for, for God's word, for God's glory? Or are you using it like requesting something from your maid? God, I want this. God, I, I like that. I, God, I deserve this. Second, to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus, you must be willing to embrace the hardship of that unentangled commitment. There is hardship to be faced. Yeah. We cannot be entangled in the things of this world. The scriptures tell us, and correct me if I'm wrong, aren't we sojourners? We are foreigners in this land. This is not our home. When we, are, when we are here in this life, in this earth, this is only temporary. And we're moving through. But so many of us, we act as if this is a whole enchilada right now. I need the best house. I need the best car. I need the most comfort. Like the bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys says wins. But I've seen ones now that say still dies. This is not it. And we cannot be entangled in the things of this life, in this world. There are things that we have to do. I mean, Paul was a tent maker, wasn't he? Paul had to make his tents to, to uh, continue on with, with the ministry. There are things that we have to do. He's not suggesting that we quit our jobs and sell our houses and sit and wait for him to come. But he is suggesting, no, he is commanding that we no longer allow the things of this world to take our attention away from the battle that we are in. You know, if you look at some of these foreign countries where persecution is heavy, they don't have time to get involved in all the social things in their country. They are busy trying to live for Christ and die for Christ <coughs> in many cases. But here in America where where the gospel comes so easy. We, we think that, that we can live like the world and have Christ. And it just isn't so. It just isn't so. One, one author said that a soldier in the Middle East doesn't have time to, to set up a souvenir stand or open a fast food restaurant for a little extra money while, he's, while he is deployed. We are deployed, folks. That's what this is. This is a deployment in this life. And we cannot, we must not let this life rule who we are and what we do. The word used for entanglement here in the original Greek, it's a, it's a word that is, is uh, used to say, to say a part of, that entanglement is a part of the world, a part of those things that we, we shouldn't be. And I tell you, there's a lot of things that in themselves are not bad, but when they take us away from the attention of seeking first the, the kingdom of God, seeking first the righteousness of God, being that soldier, then they become bad, don't they? And that includes... Make no mistake, that includes our families. Because family can take us away. And there's nothing bad about a family. But family can take us away if we allow it to. 
over the last 21 years of, of ministry, so many times I've seen people who are, are not worshiping God together because of family reasons. We have to be sure to turn ourselves in the right direction. I came across this when I was, was studying. You've heard of the book, Your Money Matters? In, in the book, uh, Dr. McGregor tells of a man who had gone into a business for himself. He came to him for, for counsel. A tremendous opportunity had come along. Once he got the, the business established, he was going to have a lot of time available to minister at the church and to help others. He had excitedly told his family that he had found an opportunity to be his own boss and to have freedom he wanted. They must understand that for a short period of time he was going to pour a lot of work and time into getting the business started. But after that he would have a lot of extra time. He would be able to help out at church and perhaps coach the Little League. And they would do things together as a family. So the first thing he did was resign his position on the church council. Because the council met on Saturdays, and that was one day he had to be at work. But as soon as he got his business started, he would go back to the council. Business was going well, but he was not going to the midweek services anymore. Because they were happening on the night and the time when he had to catch up on his paperwork. Then he quit teaching Sunday school because he didn't have time to prepare his lessons. Next, he stopped coming to Sunday evenings. Then the crisis set in. And he was not in church on Sunday mornings for six, eight, ten weeks. Now sitting across the desk from McGregor, his business was destroyed. And he was facing bankruptcy. And he asked, why would God put me into this business just to fail? Why would God put me in this business just to fail? Was the business the failure? The failure came because he did not put first what was first. And we've all been guilty. All of us have been guilty of doing that. We, we get sidetracked on something that's important. I'm not saying business isn't important. I'm not saying family isn't important. But we get sidetracked to that and let go of what is most important. Third, a good soldier of Christ. must live daily to please the Lord, the one who enlisted him. You know, the one who enlists us into the Lord's army, that is Christ, isn't it? This isn't a volunteer army. We didn't volunteer for it. We were <coughs> drafted. When, when Christ came upon us, and when he saved us, he drafted us into his service. Period. Someone can say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to be a soldier for Christ. Well, then you're not a Christian. Because if you're a Christian, you are a soldier. What's the, the kid song? I'm in the Lord's army. That comes with being a follower of Christ. It is, it is natural. It is automatic. And it is for every, and I said it earlier, blood-bought Christian to be a soldier of Christ. Why do we do it? Why do we put ourselves through, through the things that we go through? Because if you've truly stood up for Christ, and if you've truly put first the first things, you have been attacked. You have been ridiculed. You have, you have received some sort of persecution for it. And if you have done that, why would you continue? One, because you know what Christ has done for you, right? You know what he has saved you from. By the way, trick question. What has he saved you from? Himself. Himself. Okay. His wrath. He has saved you from his wrath. Yes, that is hell. But it, it's more than just hell. It is separation from it. It is his wrath. It is it is. Worse than anything we could possibly imagine being poured out on us. That's what he saved us from. 
And what, what is it that we cling to as we serve and we face these things? That one day we're going to stand in front of him, and after giving an account for our lives, we're going to give that account. He'll say, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, well done, good and faithful servant. Anybody else want to hear those words? But do we want to hear them bad enough to live for him completely? To sell out, not to let this world take us away? Fourth thing about being a soldier. To be a good soldier of Christ, remember that you are enduring hardship together with all soldiers. See, Paul doesn't tell him to go suffer. He says to join in the suffering. You see this? He's saying, come join in the suffering because that's what happens when you truly believe. The Greek word here is a compound word. I'm not giving you the words because I couldn't figure out how to pronounce either one of them. But uh, it, it means to suffer hardship with. When, when he's saying this to, to join, he's saying to suffer hardship with. And who is it with that we're suffering the hardship? Each other, the brothers and sisters, the saints, the saved, the born again, the redeemed. That's who we're, we're suffering with. We are to stand with each other. It's a whole lot easier to take an attack when you're standing with somebody, isn't it? Or somebody standing with you. You know, with uh, all the stuff that's happened with my heart surgery and the, the being down, not being able to preach last week, I had Jared Matthew standing with me. Jared came in here Sunday morning and, and, and preached. Matthew preached Sunday night. And they took care of everything. I didn't have to worry about coming down and opening up or making up bulletins. I didn't have to worry about anything. I was able to, to stay home and stay down. It's special to have brothers and sisters come alongside of us. Our strength comes from the Lord. But he also uses our brothers and sisters coming alongside of us to strengthen us. Too often, though, we forget that. And we begin to think we're all alone. You remember somebody in the scriptures who thought he was all alone? In 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, he, he's running from Jezebel. And finally he lays down. And he just says, I'm all alone. He said, there's... There's no one left, and they seek my life. Was he the only one left? No. That chapter tells us that uh, he had 7,000, right? 7,000. You ever feel alone? Like, <laughs> we're doing this all by ourselves? We're not. But that is the tool of the devil to isolate. Because if he can isolate us and, and we begin to think that we are alone, that is the first step in him causing us to give up. To give up the fight. Because when we begin to think we're alone, we just we want to be like Elijah. We just want to lay down and say, I quit. We've lost focus on, on what is important. We've lost focus on what is first. And, and we just... We just want to lay down. When, when we go into war as a country, they send them in platoons and squads and companies, right? They don't send them alone. There might be a mission that they go alone on, but they send them in groups to support and to keep each other. When, when Paul and, and Silas and, and these men would go out on these missionary journeys, what did they do? They took others with them, didn't they? They knew the hardships they were going to face. We need to have our brothers and sisters, our true brothers and sisters in Christ, standing with us. 
That is part of what God uses by his Holy Spirit to strengthen us. So we're to be this soldier for Christ. A soldier's life is not easy. You know, we, we, we look at, at men in the military, women in the military, and we see the, the commercials and we see the articles about, about uh, wounded soldiers who have, have uh, been, been uh, either killed or wounded in, in military battles. But it really hits home if one of our children says they want to go into the military, especially during wartime. Well, that really hits home. That battle and those wounds become very real, don't they? Or it comes, becomes very real when you, when you walk into a, a store and you, you see a man in a wheelchair or a woman in a wheelchair because their legs were blown off or, or, or uh, mutilated in battle. So now they're, they're in a wheelchair. It becomes real, doesn't it? This is a real battle, folks. You cannot see the enemy, but the enemy can see you. And it's real. I know in, with men I talked to that were in Vietnam, that was one of the things they said. They said you could hardly, you could hardly ever see the enemy. They, they were like invisible in the jungles. They, they just blended in. Our enemy is there, he's real, and he's blending in. We need to understand that the devil, the enemy, the goal is not for us to worship him. Would he like that? Absolutely. He would love for us to worship him. But his goal is that we do not worship God. His goal is, is the one who cast him out. Not have followers. Not have those who love him. Not have those who worship him. Not get the respect, honor, and glory that he deserves. That is the goal of the devil. That is the goal of the evil one. It is not to get worship for himself, though he would love that. And so when our attention goes to one of these other things, we're losing the battle. We need to be careful. As he goes on in our our text, I find it here. Verse 5, he says, An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So he's using three different illustrations here. The first one's the soldier, second one's the athlete, third one is the farmer. So this, the athlete will not be crowned unless he competes according to the rules. For an athlete to compete, in a major competition, what does it take? <coughs> I'll, I'll say it again. Practice. Practice. Dedication. Training. Training. Commitment. And a knowledge of the rules, right? If they do not do this, they will lose. They're, they will have no chance of winning. We, we have to embrace the, the hardship of an athlete. I, I remember Sid Catterson, who, who um, is the AD for the basketball program for the homeschoolers. I remember when Sid was the soccer coach for Flint Hills Christian School. And those kids would have to show up, and then he would run them, basically from Flint Hills Christian School, basically clear to the lake and back. They didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. But he was training them to be able to run up and down that field for the whole soccer game. They had to, to learn the endurance. Then he trained them in, in the rules. There's, there's three things I want to look at with the athlete. You do not become a world-class athlete by accident. You do not become godly by accident. It is not osmosis. You cannot look at the Bible and grow. 
today's world, we, we have so many get, get rich, get skinny quick plans, right? You open up a magazine, you turn on the TV, there's, there's somebody going to sell you something that with 10 minutes a day, you can lose all the weight you want to lose. If they were true, I'd be skinny. There's somebody else out there telling you that you can get rich quick by buying real estate and turning it. And overnight, you can become independently wealthy. And then there's those out there telling you that you can become spiritually sound without having to put any effort into it. But like an athlete, we have to train. We have to be disciplined. We have to do those things that, that allow us to get stronger and better at what we do. You know, we can wish for godliness all day long. And we can try all the magic remedies. But it's not going to do anything until discipline becomes a part of our daily life. And we spend the time in God's Word. We spend the time learning. We spend the time studying. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 7, he said, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. We've got to discipline ourselves. Those disciplines include the reading and praying. If you do not spend time in God's Word, how is that disciplining yourself? How are you going to grow without spending time in it? I know a lot of people who get all of their spiritual knowledge from somebody else's mind, from somebody else's mouth. They do not open the Bible for themselves. They hear what other people say and decide if they agree or not agree. Well, what is the basis for agreeing or not agreeing? If it's not God's word, because you're not in it, how do you know what to agree with? How do you know what to disagree with? It has to be God's word. Second thing with an athlete is you must compete according to the rules. And it's that way as a Christian. If you do not compete according to the rules as an athlete, what happens? You get disqualified. That's exactly right. I, I watched that football game yesterday, and, and one of the K-State players hit had a late hit on a quarterback, and, and he was disqualified for the rest of that game and for the first half of the next game because he did what he did. He did not stay within the rules, and it cost not only him but his team. If we're going to win the race that Paul talks about for an imperishable crown, then we have to be in the Word and know the rules. How can we be praying for God to make our children morally pure when we're on the internet looking at pornography? How can we expect our, our children to come and know who Christ is when, when we are engaged with things that do not reveal Him? How can we expect our children to put Christ first and seek first the kingdom of God when we have a whole list of things that draw us away from God that we would do before we would serve Him? <coughs> How are we supposed to do that? We need to know the expectations, the rules of what the scripture lays out. And thirdly, the aim for competing is the prize. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, to run in such a way that we might win. We need to run to win. I'll never Forget the first time I went and saw Bradley run state cross country. I had never really been to a cross country meet before. And so I, I really didn't know what to expect, but I wanted to be there to, to support Bradley. And, and I'm watching these kids coming in. And as, as they're coming in, they're falling. They're, they're passing out. They're vomiting. 
because they pushed their bodies and themselves as hard as they could to get to the end to win the race that they set all the signals of their body aside to win the race. As the AD for the football program with the homeschoolers for a couple of years, one of the things the coaches would do in our summer camp is they would run the kids till they got sick. So that they could get them started. They, they, figured, they figured that practice didn't start until somebody got sick. They'd run them hard, run them hard, run them hard. And what they're doing is they're trying to teach them to put aside those things that would stop them from being their best. One of my favorite basketball players is, is Michael Jordan, not so many people my age. And I, I think back to, to some of the, the uh, championship games, and one, one series in particular, he had the flu, he was sick, and he was out there playing better than anybody else on the court. He was running fever and all these other things. But he put his own body and needs aside to run the race. Folks, we need to put our, our needs aside to run the race. It doesn't mean we don't give them attention. It means we don't give them first attention. We need to run the race. I, I came across this, this story here uh, about a, a 19th century pastor. He had sent some men into the mission field. One of the men's name was, was Henry Martin. And he went to India and to Persia, and he died at age 31 of tur tuberculosis. This was before photography. And uh, somebody had painted a portrait of him just before he had, he had died, and he sent it to this Pastor Simeon. And he was shocked as he looked at it and, and saw that this man was so sick he yet continued to serve. He took that portrait, he, he hung it above his mantle, to remind him that there is a cost in running the race to win. In, in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, this is something that uh, John Piper talks about. He, he says, which is a wasted life? The man who, who uh, worked hard and, and retired young and, and had many years of retirement and the money to do what he wanted to do? Or, or the young man who... <clears throat> who went into the mission field and was, was killed at at young age of, of 20s or 30s, serving God. Which one wasted their life? We have a prize to win. And we're not going to win it if we're not willing to suffer. Now moving along to try to get this all in today. The third was the farmer. The third area that we have here, if I look at verse 6, it is the hard-working farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. So he gives us this third example, to be willing to embrace the hardship of being a farmer. You know, we were talking a little yesterday on our trip down there, you know, farming has changed in today's world. But we were, as we were going down to Emporia, we were seeing all these, these old stone walls. Now there's, there's some that have been rebuilt, but there's a lot around Kansas of these old stone walls. I think I may have shared this a few weeks ago, but those stones came out of the fields. For them to be able to cultivate their fields, they had to go and get all these rocks out of the way so that they could plant their, their seed. And, and so they would take them and they'd use them and they'd build these, these stone fences. But that was hard work. And that was before they even started the planting. That was before they started preparing the ground. They had to do all this hard work. And, and to be a farmer, <clears throat> to be a farmer is sometimes not only hard work, but it's pretty boring. You know, what, what is it? Uh, a, a soldier, a soldier has, has the battles and, and the edge being life and death that he has to be awake and alert for. The, the athlete has the cheer of the crowd. But 
What does the farmer have? You know, a sign out on the highway that says one farmer feeds however many people? It's a hard and boring job, but it's a lot of hard work. If you truly look at the farmer, he's the man that's up early in the morning, isn't he? And he's going. He's, he's out there doing the work. And what does he have to what does he have to look forward to? Well, he has the harvest, but what about between now and the harvest? Oh, the corn grew two inches this week. You know? Paul's saying that that's the way the Christian life is. Sometimes you work hard. You get up early. You stay late. You, you, you feel like there's nobody else doing the, the planting, doing the cultivating. You're doing it, and you have to continue on. Otherwise, it dies. And then there's storms that come along. And, and it wipes out the whole crop. Who was we was talking to? Well, they, you and I, Cynthia, was talking to somebody. And they, they said that their corn had been wiped out this year because of the, the drought. So they were about to do beans. The beans coming in. These things take place in, in these storms. And they tear down the work that they've done. <coughs> and in our Christian walk, it's sometimes the way. We, we work and we work and we start to see a little bit of growth. We start to see, we start to see uh, the corn coming up a little bit, the wheat coming up a little bit. And, and then all of a sudden a storm comes along and it seems to just wipe it all out. Do we quit? I tried for and it didn't work. What happens to the farmer that does that? What's that? He starves. He starves, yeah. Yeah. Or goes to work for McDonald's. It's, up. it's not how we do it as a Christian. Either. When we work and we work and, and we start to see that growth and the storm comes and tears it down, we just keep working, don't we? We don't stop. The farmer can't stop. The farmer has to continually be putting out new seed. The storm comes <coughs> on the man I was talking to. He was talking about how, how it took out his, his corn. Well, he went right back with beans. He has to keep putting out the seed. <coughs> And you and I need to do the same thing, don't we? As Christians, we need to be planting the seed, planting the seed. Where does the harvest come from? Apollos plants, Apollo water. But the increase comes from where? From the Lord. So if the increase doesn't come where we're seeing it with our own eyes and experiencing it, <coughs> Does that mean we should stop? No, it means we continue on. Because the Lord gives the increase. There will be a harvest for the work that we have done that we may never see on this side of heaven. But if we stop doing the work, then the question has to be asked, were we ever His to begin with? So we continue the work to see the harvest at the end of times. And you think of the, the men and the talents, and the master didn't expect the man with one talent to bring him back as much as the man that had ten talents. The harvest will be according to what God sees fit to give us. But we are to do the work and to keep busy with it and not to be taken back. This finishes up this, this text. I know we're after 12 and we're going to finish up here in just a second. Let me. Verse 7 says, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Paul's telling Timothy, think about these things. Because this is how you have to behave. If you choose to stop, it reveals your lack of Christ. And it's hard work, folks. Jesus often would, would try to get away by himself. In fact, Jesus, in doing the, the planting and being being the soldier that he was, 
He was so tired one time that in the middle of a storm, he fell asleep in the back of the boat. Because in his tiredness, he still knew he could trust God. He knew who was in control. Do we know? Can we trust him? Let's think on these things so that we can that we can turn and trust the one who, who we need to trust. Now, I just want to I just want to give four questions for you of application. As I was thinking about this, I, I kind of came up with these. I plan to put them in the bulletin, but first one. Since it's so easy to drift into easy, comfortable Christian life, how can we avoid it? And what are the warning signs? See, we, we try to drift into that comfortable life, and it's easy to do if we let it up, isn't it? But what we have to do is stand strong. Next one. What are the, what are the practical ramifications do the metaphor of soldier, athlete, and farmer bring to your mind? Can you think of some other ways that, that these, <coughs> these uh, give you an illustration of what it is? Third, some people equate discipline with legalism. Are they the same thing? Can you be legalistic and loving at the same time? Fourth question. Since we often can't see the visible results in ministry, how can we evaluate whether we whether we are being effective in serving Christ? Well, these aren't questions I want to answer. These are questions I want you to answer. Because we have these questions come up in our mind. We need to take these three illustrations and think on them. Think on these questions and see where God leads you. The goal of this message was, was this, to bring honor and glory to God and to strengthen you to give all you have to Christ. Let it be the first thing be first thing. As I close, I, I think of Revelation. When, when Jesus tells the church, you forgot your first love. They forgot their first thing, and in doing so, they forgot the first love, which is the love of Christ. Let's not forget. Please stand with me. Father, as we, as we finish and as we close here today, Lord, Father, strengthen us to be those who serve you and serve you well. Strengthen us, Lord, to, to be able to be that soldier, to be able to run that race, and to be willing to work through the hardships of farming. That many would come to see you, to know you, to see your great glory, that you be glorified because of the efforts that you put in through us. Use us, Lord, your servants, your children, those who you have saved. In the name of Christ Jesus, I pray.